that you should show if you're a young um, and up and coming researcher. And this is what you should show if you're um, over the hill and moving down. Like myself, um, this is a session obviously on PNG. And my name is Joel Kastner. This is uh, the Rochester Institute of Technology being represented and the Laboratory for Multi Wave One Faster Physics. I put that there because this is a logo that Marcus made for us. Um, unlike uh, um, Albert, um, I'm not actually directing anything that does anything. It's just a, a siphon for some money that allows students to do good things to our team. Um, and no, see, I put my thank you right here, but it's not to the people in this room, it's to the people that uh, pay the money, that pay the bills, NASA, NSF, and NSF. This is all a joke, by the way. Um, and this is some um, thanks to uh, Marcus and Rudy, who are actually doing all the hard work, and then I've got some collaborators here. A few. Okay, so planetary nebula shaping agents. Um, this is a, I should I, I neglected to say thank you to the local organizing committee um, and uh, a huge thank you to, to Christoph for um, such a seamlessly organized meeting, having organized asymmetrical planetary nebula two way back in 1999 in at MIT. I know how much. Work it is, and how little thanks you get, you and the, and the local organizing committee. So, thank you very much. I think you deserve a round of applause. <laughs> and then, on behalf of the scientific organizing committee, thank all of you for sure for sticking with the meeting through four days so far. We hope you'll stick through the four, four and a half day of the meeting tomorrow morning when we polish off the session on, on potential. Shaping agents, really the whole meeting in one way or another has been about planetary nebula shaping. Obviously, that's why we're all here. Um, I've made a list uh, of the possible shaping agents, and um, I put, rent. they're more or less organized um, in, uh, in size, in sense of size scale, going from uh, right at the progenitor AGP star through jets that may be formed through accretion disks. Uh, which imply there's some kind of star disk, disk jet interaction that we don't really understand, that, that we need to understand. Um, interacting winds, which can act on any scale you like in principle, but certainly sort of describe an intermediate scale. Magnetic fields, maybe shouldn't be here, maybe should be all the way through here, beginning with fast AGB and below rotation as a potential uh, collimating agent. Um, and interactions with the interstellar medium, which uh, Ava uh, showed us so beautifully, can shape the nebula at largest scales. And then if you've got some other alternative mechanism you'd like to propose, I think everyone in the room is all ears. Um, I just list here perhaps the pre-existing density and composition discontinuities and inhomogeneities may enhance the effects of these, four, these three agents at least, um, so that you can't neglect those sorts of, of uh, structures. In planetary and then we're talking about shaping. So here goes agents again for reference. And then binaries, 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 planets. We've heard a lot about all week long. We haven't heard too much about planets, but we've heard a lot about binaries. Um, and we always will hear about binaries as long as no one's organizing these meetings. Binary systems can set up any of these agents one through four. Fast rotation, jets, interacting winds, magnetic fields, perhaps five two interactions with the ISM. Perhaps the one that hasn't been proposed yet, number six, um, would be um, enhanced or en enabled by binary systems. And I've, I've had a laundry list here ranging from wide binaries through uh, this binary that will end up as common envelope systems as far as the sorts of effects that feed into these shaping agents. But I, I've separated binarity and planetary systems from generic shaping mechanisms because I think of binary or planetary systems as engendering the, or enabling the, the, the uh, shaping agents. And I, think, I think that's been expressed in this meeting in, in a variety of different ways. I've also separated binary systems and planetary systems because here we're talking about companions, stellar down to substellar, brown dwarf perhaps, uh, close brown dwarfs could, could do some damage in terms of shaping. Um, but the, the, the formation mechanism should be different for a stellar or substellar companion, a brown dwarf, relative to a planetary system. The, the planets presumably form a disk, a primordial disk, protoplanetary disk around the young star, whereas the companions are forming like stars. And so we need to keep that distinction in mind until it stops becoming useful. But I think it, for the time being, it is still useful to draw a distinction between these two classes. 
I won't actually just read these off. Hopefully you've had enough time now to read them yourself. Um, but the idea is that binary systems, planetary systems can affect the, the way in which uh, two through four do their business. And we just, I only put this slide in here because the nice talk, I forget the gentleman's name, I'm sorry, on um, planets around intermediate mass stars that have evolved to, to the red giant branch. Um, my apologies, I forget your name. Uh, senior moment, I guess, I'm your senior moment. At any rate, um, and this is partly in response to Bruce Ribnack's point, uh, we are missing, we are clearly missing, massive planets around uh, low to intermediate mass stars at the moment. That's a regime where we're, we're not able to, to probe at large separation very effectively at the moment. Um, however, there is a class of young star, young close star, um, I should say the, the class of young nearby stars allows us some insight into that. This is the only uh, multiple planet system that's been imaged apart from our own solar system. So, so now there's, there's an entire conference I guess you could have on this one system, HR 8799, is the only image of a multiple planet system I'm aware of other than our own solar system, of course. And here you've got a solar system on steroids, uh, the intermediate mass primary, HR 8799, about one and a half solar masses, I believe, A star. Um, and its planets are way out of orbits um, that begin around the orbit of Uranus and go way out to the well past the orbit of Uranus. Sorry, Florida, yeah, Uranus, way out to the, um, into, into uh, Kuiper Belt territory. And then there's Beta Pic. This, so this system is 30 million years old. That's why you can image these planets, because they're giving off a lot of their own infrared radiation from contraction. Here's Beta Pic, which has recently moved uh, from 12 million years old to 21 million, million years old. It's not because it fast forwarded 9 million years in evolutionary time, it's because the Beta Pic moving group has now been um, dated to about 21 million years. And it has a a massive planet, I don't think anyone has a good guess for what the mass is, probably 5 to 10 Jupiter masses, at about 10 AU, Saturn's orbit. So this, this, this is just the point here, I said there's uh, a, a regime of planets that we're missing at the moment, but I think over the next 5, 10 years with extreme adaptive optics and chronographs, we're going to be able to recover a lot of these planets, especially around you know, nearby stars. So, um, I'm going to zip uh, into detail, uh, zip ahead into detail, on one of the mechanisms that I highlighted, um, the interactive winds shaping mechanism. And um, this is just selfish, I admit. And it's partly uh, because I mean, there wasn't time up until the present uh, the meeting to really talk about certain aspects of the Chandra Planetary Nebula Survey that I think um, are shedding light on interacting winds. Um, Chan Plans is now in full swing. And as you saw in Marcus's poster, I hope, uh, we have four new detections, and uh, I perhaps shouldn't have said hot bubble here, apologies. We have four new detections of diffuse X-ray sources. Uh, I'm going to just talk about diffuse X-ray sources because of the ways in which they can shed light on uh, interacting winds as a, as a shaping mechanism. So with these detections of diffuse X-ray sources, the overall Chan Plans X-ray detection rate is now at about 30%. That's actually where it was before cycle 14, we have about 54 objects surveyed so far. 15 of these uh, show diffuse X-rays. The detection rate, as a couple times I have mentioned, or Marcus has mentioned, the detection rate of, X of diffuse X-rays from planetary nebula with wolf ray central stars stands at 100%, 5 over 5. And that's not counting a couple more objects that are beyond the, the distance uh, cutoff of, of the, the survey. OK, so we've got 15. Count them 15 detections of diffuse emission. It's time to separate them into classes. Don't you agree? We have, I think, three classes of diffuse X-ray source. There are the classical hot bubble planetaries, eight objects so far. They all show nested shells and ANSI. They all have thin, intact central shell rims. They are all non-dusty and molecule poor. They have X-rays, and, and Bruni was, um, was urging me to temper this. They have X-rays throughout the inner bubble, bubble, although you can argue that maybe some of them are a little brightened. Um, and they have unexpectedly low uh, plasma emission temperatures, which I don't have time to talk about. I actually, is just discussed that a little bit. Heat conduction being one possible mechanism, but no one I actually proposed, I don't know, a half a dozen mechanisms or something like that in the paper about 10 years ago. And then more recently, no one uh, suggested that perhaps pickup ions um, from the interstellar medium, polluting the planetary nebula hot bubble can cool those hot bubbles off. Then we have the planetaries with Wolf Ray central stars. They
their acid glass, ragged, clumpy nebulae with incomplete or thick main shells, in contrast to these thin, intact central shells. Uh, they're dusty. Some of them have molecules uh, weakly present. Uh, they have limb-brightened extra emitting regions. And then they're the planetary nebulae with collimated outflows. These are dynamically very young planetaries. Um, there are two of them. <laughs> Bipolar planetaries, they seem to be, and they're dusty and molecule-rich. And the X-rays in these cases trace collimated flows very nicely. And in contrast to the classical hot bubbles, these X-rays seem to have reasonable temperatures. The plasma has regional, reasonable temperatures given as simple assumptions for, for shocks. So let me take you through these in a little bit more detail. Um, I hope uh, some of you at least have had a chance to um, look back through the, the um, fast molding archives of the Chandra News, or if you will in the future, take a look at this paper, which uh, paper article, which is a lot, was a lot of fun for Rini and I to write, um, in which we informed the rest of the X-ray community that they should pay attention to planetary nebulae because they're interesting for a variety of reasons. I put this here because um, the Chandra folks chose four hot bubble planetaries, classical hot bubbles, to put um, as the cover illustration of this Chandra News uh, issue that came out in the spring of, 20, of this year. As I say, no one's going to ever look at this again, so people in this room may, may as well read it and enjoy it because no one else will probably at this point. Um, these four nebulae have these nested shell structures. They have prominent ANSI. You've got NGC you 16543, the cat's eye. I'm going to forget the names and I can't even read them here. Um, this is 7009. Well, I won't try, but you go, go look at the article and you'll see which ones they are. Um, this is a cycle. 14 detection, brand new detection. You can see the sort of um, problems we're beginning to have now as we move further out into the volume we want to survey. The nebulae are becoming uh, more and more difficult to detect. Chandra is also becoming less sensitive in the soft end, which really hurts us when we're looking for these shocked regions that show soft X-rays, diffuse X-rays. It's very difficult now to detect, more difficult than it was before to detect them. And yet, take a look at how many background photons you have here. Not many. So you have a pretty good chance of finding these diffuse X-ray emitting regions if you just have a slight overdensity of photons. And I know there were some giggles when uh, um, somebody, I forget if it was Marcus or Rudy, showed one of these images, and there were a couple of snickers, and I don't blame you for snickering when you see these images, and, you, and we claim there's a detection. I snickered myself the first couple of years when Chandra was detecting shocks, say, in Herbic Harrow flows, when someone would claim a detection from five photons. Well, it turns out five photons is often good enough if they're clustered. Um, you can do some interesting work with five photons. And considering Chandra pays you about a dollar per photon, you better, um, no, sorry, uh, about, no, I won't tell you, $2,000 per photon in some of these cases. You better do some work with these photons so you're not doing Chandra justice. Um, so as we move through these different classes, I've, I've um, highlighted for you again these properties. So these nebulae, these classical hot bubbles, including this newly detected NGC 3918, all show these nested shells and the ANSI. Uh, they have these thin, young, uh, thin, young, intact central bubbles, and that's always where you see the X-rays coming from. They're non-dusty and molecule core. Here are the wolf ray objects in contrast. Well, ignore BD plus 30 for just a second, even though it's the best detector of the bunch, um, because we don't have uh, very good um, resolution when it comes to BD plus 3. We're at the limit of what Chandra can tell us probably in terms of the surface brightness distribution. But if you look at these other four nebulae, ironically enough, all of them not as well detected as BD plus 30, we can see that the X-rays are coming from the, the rims, near the rims in each case. Look at all those photons, folks. Can you see them? I can see them from here. <laughs> if I move further away, it's easier. Yeah, no problem. And you can see it's a limb brightened bubble as well. Uh, <laughs> see, Snickers. I, I don't know. Every time you show these images, people laugh at us. Um, which is why Rudy has been working very hard to produce nice smooth images, like this one of Hubble 5. <coughs> OK, so here's NGC 7027 and Hubble 5, the third of the classes I was talking about. These are planetary nebulae with collimated flows. And if you look at NGC 7027 in one way, like the gene, uh, well, actually, across the, from the optical through the near infrared, it looks like one thing, or actually a superposition of many shapes. You look at it in X rays, you see something else entirely. You see only the collimated flows in X rays. Well, I won't 
won't try to describe everything you see here, but um, let's start with the fact that you see this set of nested shells, spirals perhaps, a lot of uh, Jasmine's uh, very nice simulations. Um, perhaps there was an episode, an Ada Karanic like episode that launched a hum uh, how do you pronounce that? Homunculus? A uh, thank, uh, thank you, a homunculus um, like structure. And then more recently, some really bad encounter launched these collimated flows that's just disrupting the entire thing right now. Um, I'll come back to, to this guy in a second. But in Hubble 5, we seem to see the same sort of thing going on, um, but at a, at a more advanced phase of evolution. Hubble 5 has these big bulbous lobes, and I don't have the right image to show you there for a second. It also, though, shows this set of nested shells or spirals, just like NGC 7027, down here near the core of the object. So it's almost as though at Hubble 5 we're seeing, seeing the breakout of these flows that are that present in an early phase in NGC 7027. These, again, are dynamically very young, bipolar, dusty, molecule rich. Okay, so I mentioned those simulations that can tell us a little bit perhaps about what's going on at the beginning of this. I don't know if anyone has a good simulation of the um, process that led to the ejection of the homunculus in the, ca in the case of Ada Karani. Um, that would be nice to see. Then it would be nice, and I think we did see a very nice illustration of what happens when you launch a more or less spherical wind into the toroidal um, uh, geometry from a previous mass loss episode. You see bipolar lobes coming up. Martin Huarte um, uh, Espinosa also showed this in a paper that we were on uh, a couple of years ago. So that those all those processes are very nice. But I think, people, it's time that we put our heads together and did something a little bit more ambitious, even if it's just for the sake of some, some good publicity. So let's see, is, it, is there a web browser? I should have asked this before I started my talk, I guess. Is this going to launch a web browser? Fingers crossed. Cross fingers with me, please. If this is a live link, PowerPoint Hub said it was going to be a live link. I'm hitting it again. So, <laughs> someone steal it. Yeah. Oh. oh, okay. Go, go. So, this, I don't know if you've had a chance to see, okay, great. I don't know if you've had a chance to see this video uh, yourselves. Uh, the speaker who was talking about interacting galaxies brought to RIT. But here you have a simulation of two interacting galaxies. I believe it's an SPH simulation involving stars and gas in these two spirals. And they go through an extended phase of interaction, moving through each other's gravitational potential wells. And each time the scene rotates, and there you see a Hubble Space Telescope image of an interacting, pair of interacting galaxies that looks pretty close to what the simulation shows. Not perfect, but yeah, pretty close, I would say. And if I didn't know the limitations of SPH codes, like the experts do, I would probably say, wow, okay, this has all been explained now. Well, I don't know. So I think it's all been explained now. Because I don't know the details. And I don't know which interaction galaxies pairs these are. Um, I, some of you probably do. I think we're going toward the antennae. That's what I do know. Right? Here's the antennae. Is that right? Okay, so I think that's just a wonderful illustration of how a simulation that presumably, I don't know, maybe there are any of the people who worked on that simulation in the room? I better be careful what I say. Well, anyway, I would presume that simulation has real physics in it. And the images are certainly real images. <laughs> Uh-oh, okay, so I am going to get myself in trouble. But... So, okay, I'm just a lousy observer. And, and this is all I've been able to do so far. So if, imagine, if you will, just reads a uh, uh, very nice simulation of the binary interaction producing spirals, because that's the very first thing you would see here. And then you have some simulation where a, a close periastral encounter knocks a whole bunch of mass off of a, an evolved star and generates a homunculus. Uh, and then you've got a catastrophic event when you actually somehow uh, have the entire envelope removed by one or more of those periastral encounters, and that's what produces NGC 
step. So that's where you start, and then the interpreter in me takes over and imagine that now disappearing and zooming in, or sorry, dissolving into this NGC 7027 image. And now you have one of those simulations of a spherical outflow in the torus. <laughs> Blows out the hose. Leaves a nice torus with very raggedy lobes eventually, and then you end up with just the ring that's left over. Okay, I'm done. Theorists, all you have to do is connect those dots. <laughs> and we're all done. I mean, the, you want to see it again, right? I spent a lot of time doing this. Sorry? Connect them Gravity. Gravity? That's all you need? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll buy that. <laughs> Since I spent so much time doing this last night, I just had to play it again, and then I'll um, move on. <laughs> uh, I did want to mention, though, this is constrained by observations. The X-ray observations constrain this sequence. We see very bright X-rays, the K-1 